be comfortable saying no. Um, it's not the last time you're gonna get the great opportunity and the next time that it comes around might be the perfect time. Welcome to Honest Ecommerce, a podcast dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer, and I believe running a direct-to-consumer brand does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. On this podcast, we interview founders and experts who are putting in the work and creating real results. I also share my own insights from running our top Shopify consultancy, Electric Eye. We cut the fluff in favor of facts to help you grow your e-commerce business. Let's get on with the show. All right, everybody. After some technical difficulties, we are back. Welcome to another episode of Honest E-Commerce Today. Bringing to the show an amazing founder. Uh, joining me today is Lindsay Johnson. She is the CEO and founder of Wheezy, a luxury monogrammed bath towel brand. Uh, I want to throw in the word luxury again. These are awesome products. I was goofing around on the website before we started today. Lindsay, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. I feel like my coffee just hit me. I'm talking super fast. So I'm going to try to try to slow myself down here. So uh, you guys have been rocking and rolling since October of 2018. But let's go back just a little bit before that. Kind of what, what led up to uh, the inception of the brand? What were you up to? Yeah, so I was actually working in finance um, before launching Wheezy with my co-founder. Um, so I worked in a variety of different roles. Um, investment banking. I worked in like a crisis management role abroad um, and then was at a hedge fund for a couple years. Um, and then most recently started investing in consumer businesses, um, early stage businesses, and actually attended Columbia Business School in New York um, with the goal of going into venture capital um, when my co-founder Liz approached me um, with the idea for what is now Wheezy. Um, so definitely uh, took a little bit of a turn there away from my finance career, but um, haven't looked back since. Uh, that's amazing. So um, we were talking a little bit pre-show and having some of the history and experience with uh, kind of the CPG space consumer packaged goods, you said uh, not much of it translated over. Is there anything from your finance world that translated over to running an e-commerce business? Yeah. I mean, I think my finance background definitely just like taught me the value of hard work and kind of being analytical and, and thoughtful, being a great problem solver. Um, worked pretty insane hours um, the first couple of years out of school. Um, so definitely just, I think, kind of grit um, and tenacities in there, time management skills, um, kind of a lot of those things have certainly been applicable um, to my day job in terms of, I think, you know, industry specific, um, definitely nothing, <laughs> nothing really um, in the textile world until now. Um, so I've had to learn that stuff from the ground up. But um, for sure, I think there's there's some lessons learned um, for my finance career, for sure. Awesome. So let's talk about how uh, the idea came about. I'm sure there's a bunch of entrepreneurs out there that they just they want to do something. They, they feel it, but they don't, you know, the idea hasn't come to them yet. So I always like to ask kind of where'd yours come from? Yeah. So it's actually, I have to give the credit to my co-founder, Liz. Um, she, I think some of the best businesses have started just when like you have a true consumer problem, less of the like, here's a whiteboard, let's come up with an idea and more of like, Hey, this is actually an annoying pain point in my life. Um, this, there's gotta be a better way. Um, which is exactly how Wheezy was started. So she, um, was registering for bath house for her wedding. And when she was picking out a product, she found there to be an overwhelming number of brands, um, a lot of jargon that was super confusing. Um, price did not indicate quality. So there was like super expensive towels that weren't actually luxury and vice versa. Um, and just the entire purchasing process, um, you know, for lack of a better phrase, didn't really spark joy with her. Um, and she really wanted to get them embroidered and monogrammed. Um, and that process was entirely offline, having to wait, you know, up to a month to get her product back. And once she finally did, um, she was super disappointed with the way that it looked, um, the performance of the towel. And she sent a text to a bunch of girlfriends of which I was one, um, asking if anyone had a recommendation for a towel brand. Um, it was honestly crickets. No one had a great brand, a go-to brand. Um, and that's where she sort of got the idea that there has to be a better way. And there was a hole in the market. Um, her background is in, in creative. So she's our creative director. And she actually, you know, approached me separately and said, like, do you think this is a good business idea? Um, because I was working in um, investing in early stage businesses at the time. So, you know, that conversation um, start, I'm, I'm actually pessimist by nature. So uh, my immediate answer was no. Um, and then the more time she spent um, kind of, you know, with anecdote, telling me anecdotes, and then I spent talking to potential customers, um, asking people, you know, where'd you buy your towels? How much you pay for them? When did you buy them? Did you get the monogrammed? 
you know, why or why not? I started getting really excited by the idea um, and realized she was on to something. And um, that conversation really just snowballed. Um, so I went from kind of pursuing the, the venture capital um, career path while in school to um, helping her start Wheezy. That's awesome. Now with getting into uh, you know starting a brand, obviously you figure out the idea, you do some research, you figure out all right there maybe there is a market here. Uh, we're on to something. Uh, how does that evolve into you know launching a dot com? And you know, I'm, there's a million steps that we're skipping here, but you know, yeah. kind of what was what what was predicated? What happened before launching the thing? I'd say we spent. I mean. Uh, the most of our time, I mean, two kind of key things. One is defining the problem, making sure you're super clear on what problem you're solving. Um, so that for us meant talking to customers um, and just, you know, making sure we were crystal clear on like what, why um, there was a hole and kind of what hole needed to be filled. And then the second part of that, and probably even more important is really the solution. So can you actually solve this problem and, and how are you going to solve it? And for us, um, that meant over a year of product development. So um, really on the physical product side, we invested a ton of time there, making sure that we weren't just kind of creating a better purchase experience or a cool and fun brand, but you know, delivering the same product that everyone could access elsewhere. Um, we really wanted to innovate on the product side. So that's definitely where we spent most of our time. Um, and then given the fact that we offer customization, um, figuring out like the physical operations um, of how to service that need for our customers um, was also a big, a big heavy lift for us. Yeah, I can only imagine figuring the uh, the building and the efficiencies there to be able to do that at scale it just sounds like a, a big uh, challenge to overcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it, it's... Um, ever evolving challenge, I would say. <laughs> Something we work on all the time. That's amazing. All right. So you guys have an amazing product uh, that you've worked on. You've got an awesome idea. What is kind of the go to market strategy? How did you launch the brand and how how'd that work? Yeah, we took an approach. Um, I should say we, we were bootstrapped from the beginning. So we didn't have a lot of capital to work with, um, which I think actually worked to our advantage. Um, and I would recommend if, if folks can figure out a creative way to finance the business um, to do so. Um, in the early days. So what that meant for us is that we spent a ton of time on PR. So we decided we were going to invest in earned media. What that meant was like hustling, talking to editors, getting product in front of the right people, um, doing a press preview day, introducing ourselves, the brand story. Um, and, and kind of we really spent, I mean, months leading up to launch on that. Um, I think a lot of people sort of skip that stuff because they're so excited to get to launch. Um, but magazines and art, you know, editors and articles, they have lead times as well. So um, I think we were patient with it um, and spent a ton of time on earned media. And then ultimately what that led to was having Fast Company kind of announce the launch of the business um, on the morning of October 9th, 2018. I'll never forget it. Um, and then, you know, multiple outlets picked up the article after that. Um, and the, that's really kind of what launched the company. Yeah, that's a, an amazing strategy. It's a kind of similar to maybe launching with an influencer thing is the popular phrase these days that people are always talking about. But I, I, I agree. I think people either... They're in two camps when they're about to launch. It's either they're terrified to launch and they just don't do it. <laughs> and so if you're in that camp, I would just do it. But on the other yeah, end, totally. if you want to launch with a plan, uh, I think launching with... Uh, you just, like I, I the, the editorial route and earned media that's amazing. Influencers is amazing. Um, I think launching with paid ads is probably the worst way to do it because nobody knows who you are. Right. Uh, but yeah, that's that. There's. I think you really want to like establish credibility, and um, that way, when you start running paid ads, which we did do, you know, several months later, um, there's that credibility. Like, oh, these articles read about them, and these people have used them, and you have customer, you know, reviews, um, and I think that really kind of gives you. Um, gives people the confidence to try your product. So with with the launch, you don't have to share numbers or anything. But like, was it? Did you guys feel it was successful? Was it higher than your expectations? You know, how'd that all go? Definitely higher than expectations. I, I like I said, I'm a pessimist. Yeah. So everything we do, um, I like to like under <laughs> expect and then be really excited um, when things go better than planned. So I had no idea what to think um, in terms of well, what we would see on day one. And um, to tell you how unprepared we were for the success, it was just myself and co-founder and our embroiderer um, kind of sitting in this storage unit <laughs> with embroidery machines and towels, like waiting for orders to come in. And 
um, we thought we'd be packing, you know, a couple boxes that first day and um, we got enough orders to keep us busy for weeks um, on day one. And so we, we actually had like on Shopify, you can set a notification where you get like a notification every time you get an order. Oh, yeah, that's the best sound ever. Oh, yeah. It's just like ching, ching, ching. And um, we were just shocked. It was going off all day to the point where we turned it off um, <laughs> because it was day, like day one. You had to turn it off. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it was awesome. And I think, you know, we were just so validated, um, you know, in kind of all the research and hard work we had done over the past year and a half. But that's when the fun really began. So, um, you know, actually getting those products out to customers and then figuring out, OK, now that we've like have proof of concept. Um, how do we actually scale this thing? Um, and you know, who do we need to hire? What processes do we need to put in place? Where do we need to invest our time and money and resources, um, to make sure the success continues? Awesome. So you guys are, um, not relatively young cause DDC is such a fast moving industry. You're yeah. going on four years, three years. It'll I don't know. Three, uh, yeah, it'll be three years this October. So, um, we're about two and a half years old. Okay. So in the last two and a half years, um, what is a mistake that you guys made along the way that you want to let our listeners know? Please don't do this. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm making mistakes every single day. <laughs> um, that's, you know, why this job is, is so challenging and fun. Um, I think something that sticks out to me from like the early days, if you're just kind of getting off the ground is, um, we made the mistake of going after what I would call like shiny objects in the early days. I think opportunities will present your present themselves. Like you'll be surprised who comes knocking on your door um, with a great new idea for you or a partnership opportunity or a new revenue stream you hadn't thought of. Um, and you know, it's, it's hard not to be flattered, especially when you're, you're a brand new business. Um, and I think we made the mistake of, um, following those shiny objects when instead we really should have just kept our heads down, focused on our plan um, and, and sort of what we had set out to do. Because I think anytime, you know, when you have such a small team, especially taking your eye off the ball um, is really detrimental. Um, so that's something that I would caution against is just try to stay focused and disciplined and um, be comfortable saying no. Um, it's not the last time you're going to get the great opportunity and the next time that it comes around might be the perfect time. Um, so that's something I would definitely caution folks in the early days. Oh, my shiny object syndrome is the bane of my existence. I, <laughs> I That's why I have a, a, a partner, to be honest, because he keeps me on track. Um, I, I just kind of within, within that same thing of saying no, I think as you as you grow... Your opportunities increase, and then the amount you should say no should also scale along with that. Um, focus is how big brands happen, um, right. and it's just I don't know. People need to hear it. You, you can't be everything to everybody. It's really hard. Um, I'm I would say I'm like more of a no person than my co-founder Liz, and even I. Um, find myself falling victim to it um, time and time again. So we, we've definitely learned our lesson now. Um, and now we're comfortable saying no. Um, it's, it's definitely gets easier the more you do it. I'll say that. <laughs> if you're struggling with scaling your sales, maybe Electric Guy can help. Our team has helped our clients generate millions of dollars in additional revenue through our unique brand scaling framework. You can learn more about our agency at electriceye.io. That's E L E C T R I C E Y E.io. Mesa is the easiest way to integrate any top e commerce app or service with your online store. Designed exclusively for the Shopify ecosystem, yes, that includes Plus, Mesa's automated workflows can get back your time spent on repetitive tasks while growing your business all at the same time. Join other merchants that have embraced the simplicity of Mesa's no-code approach to building workflows. You can create new ways to improve customer engagement, encourage repeat purchases without lifting a finger, reduce manual data entry, and much more through a simple point-and-click interface. And with Black Friday Cyber Monday planning around the corner, now is the time to ask the question, is my online store prepared? Optimizing every step in the shopping experience is the only way to create a lifelong customer. Get Mesa and capitalize on one of the biggest commerce events of the year. Visit getmesa.com slash honest for a 14-day free trial. That's G-E-T-M-E-S-A dot com slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Our partner Rewind can protect your Shopify store with automated backups of your most important data. Rewind should be the first app you install to protect your store against human error, misbehaving apps, or collaborators gone bad. It's like having your very own magic undo button. Trusted by over 80,000 businesses, from side hustles to the biggest online retailers like Gymshark, Gatorade, and Movement Watches. 
Best of all, merchants like you can get one month of automated Shopify backups for free by visiting rewind.io slash honest. That's R-E-W-I-N-D dot I-O slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Hey, everybody. Do you want to win back valuable lost time for your support team? Gorgeous has machine learning functionality that takes the pressure off small support teams and gives them the tools to manage a large number of inquiries at scale, especially during the holiday season. Gorgeous combines all your different communication channels like email, SMS, social media, live chat, and even phone into one platform and gives you an organized view of all of your customer inquiries. Their powerful functionality can save your support team hours per day and makes managing customer orders a breeze. They have allowed online merchants to close tickets faster than ever with the help of pre-written responses integrated with customer data to increase the overall efficiency of customer support. Their built-in automations also free up time for support agents to give better answers to complex product-related questions, providing next-level support, which helps increase sales, brand loyalty, and recognition. Eric Brandholtz, the founder of Beard Brand, says, We're a seven-figure business, and we have essentially one person on customer support and experience. It's impossible to do it without tools like Gorgeous to help us innovate. Learn how to level up your customer support by speaking to their team here. Visit gorgeous.grsm.io slash honest. That's G-O-R-G-I-A-S dot G-R-S-M dot I-O slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Businesses are the most successful when they own their own data, customer relationships, and their growth. That's why more than 50,000 e-commerce brands, big and small, trust Klaviyo to deliver their ideal customer experience. Klaviyo is the ultimate e-commerce marketing platform for online brands of all kinds and all sizes. With email automation, SMS marketing, list growth tools, and more, you'll get everything you need to build strong relationships that keep your customers coming back. If you're tired of relying too heavily on paid advertising or third-party marketplaces for your sales success, you're not alone. It's time to take back control of the customer experience. More and more online businesses are moving to Klaviyo to grow higher value customer relationships through personalized email and SMS marketing. And the results are staggering. Ready to drive future sales and higher customer lifetime value with a marketing platform built for your long-term growth? You should get a free trial of Clavio over at clavio.com slash honest. That's K L A V I Y O dot com slash H O N E S T. So let's talk about uh, everyone's favorite thing marketing. Uh, you guys got off the ground with this great kind of editorial push. Uh, how did things change in the last two and a half years? Where have you guys spent your time? Uh, you know, what's working for you? Yeah, marketing for us, um, it changes. I think it's an ever evolving story. So like I said, spent the first few months focused exclusively on earned media. Um, then we sort of increased the marketing mix by adding into paid advertising. So for us, that meant Facebook, Instagram, Google. Um, then, you know, we, we really did influencers, uh, um, a little bit later. And we've actually, um, to this day, never paid to work with influencers. Um, we're starting to, to, you know, change our tune a little bit there as I think the, the, um, landscape is changing and, um, expectations are changing certainly, but we were able to get away with kind of gifting in kind, um, which, you know, one was a budget constraint on our end. Like I said, we weren't well funded. Um, and we, it, it's really hard to kind of measure ROI on those things. So it was hard for me to justify spending money on something when I couldn't figure out, you know, what was actually doing for the business. Um, so for the influencers, we, we started with just gifting people who naturally were excited about the brand and, and wanted to support a young new, new company and, and really wanted the product. Um, and I think that authenticity definitely, again, helped us with that credibility piece in the early days. Um, today, we've we've been testing things like mail. Um, so that's a new, new channel for us. And I'm sure a lot of um, founders at our stage are kind of at that point where we're trying to figure out you know, if Facebook were to blow up, um, <laughs> where do we go next? Um, so those, those are some of the things on our kind of page strategy. And then I'd say on the other side of, of the marketing coin, if you will, is, is our brand marketing team. So brand marketing for us is the earned media, you know, press is still really important, partnerships, doing events. Um, now that, you know, the virus seems to be turning a corner, um, potentially thinking about, you know, retail or pop-ups, all of which I think sort of help um, with marketing the brand. Yeah, you said something that I want to kind of 
zone in on here is that you said what will happen if Facebook blows up? <laughs> yeah. Let's let's why? Why is that important? Um, I think, you know, a lot of brands and us included, um, it's become it's def first of all, it's it's way it's way more expensive today than um it's ever been. And I think it was way more expensive when we launched than it was for kind of the OG DTC brands um, that were able to take advantage of insanely low, you know, CPCs and CPMs. It and, was um, it was awesome. The Wild yeah, West. I'm, yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think it's a lot harder to grow a ba brand on paid ads today. Um, it's a lot more expensive. Um, and because we're, you know, unfunded, we're, we're, we're not funded by VCs, you know, profitability for us on first purchase is really important. So, you know, if Facebook were to get to a point where it was too expensive, we couldn't justify it. Um, and so I think for us, just knowing that if that channel were to get to a point where we couldn't afford it from a profitability standpoint, we need to have other options. Um, so having those kind of tested and vetted and figured out, you know, where our customers are outside of Instagram and Facebook is really important. And I think, you know, for us, it's, it's still a really profitable channel. Um, it's still our biggest channel. Um, it works really well, but, um, I'm not naive in thinking that, um, it's not going to continue to get more expensive and just to kind of be prepared for that. Yeah. I, my advice to any of our clients is like, we all right. We get it. We know Facebook's going to be the thing, but like we are setting up a second channel, and we're going to figure out how it works. And you'd be surprised at the success you can find on some of the other ones out there. I mean, Pinterest is wild. Like we've got just some awesome returns there for some clients. Uh, Snapchat as well. Uh, right. You know, Facebook and Instagram aren't the only playing thing. Also, Google Shopping. It like depends on your product, but pff, ooh, it's awesome. Yeah, that's been great for us as well. Google Shopping and Pinterest, we're just starting to test into our product lens. I think lends itself well to, to Pinterest. Oh, you, guys will do, you, know, you guys will do just fine on there. Yeah, home space, um, kind of decor, all that good stuff. Um, so there's definitely other channels of opportunity. Affiliate, something else we're kind of leaning into more so than we've ever had in the past. Um, so just kind of preparing for what I believe to be the inevitable future that Facebook will, <laughs> will not be the be all and all one day. Yeah, what about... Uh like uh owned marketing like so emails sms and all that jazz yeah so we actually um we've focused on that from day one um it's been important for us we don't have like a dedicated retention marketer but it, it lives actually within our brand marketing team and it's something um that's been a great performer for us um and i'd say like our email and sms program has gotten more sophisticated over time as we learn more and more about our customers um and so that's been great. You know, we introduced SMS probably six months ago now. Um, and I can't recommend that channel enough. I think um, I've been pretty excited by the performance there and was quite frankly surprised um, how well it does, um, you know, in addition to our email. So both of those programs are super important to us for sure. I've heard that uh, from a lot of our clients, that stuff that we've done and just from other people I've interviewed that, you know, SMS is almost on par, if not sometimes outperforming email in some areas. It really is. I mean, it blows my mind. I think, um, you know, we, we've been doing a lot of AB testing around, you know, where to, to launch, you know, new products and kind of like what audiences want to hear what, at when, what time. And, um, we've been seeing in some cases text outperform. Um, so it's it's definitely um, an interesting channel for sure. Yeah, I think it just goes to just communicate with your customer the where they want to be communicated with. I personally right. get out of my phone. Like I don't want you to do that. But if I am a fan of the brand, I want the email. But there are people that are the complete opposite of me. Same. <laughs> That's like, I'm like you. And that's why I was, again, a pessimist on text yeah. and was like, we'll see. I just don't think our customer is going to love this. Um, and I'm glad I was wrong. <laughs> I think it oh, also yeah. speaks to just it's testing. I mean, I think um, you just you never know until you try. And I think, um, you know, we are very deliberate when we test um, things. But I think we're kind of uh, at a point now where we're more and more comfortable, you know, taking a flyer and things. So we've, um, for instance, started to do print advertising this year, which is something that I don't think a lot of D D C brands do, but, um, you know, actually paying for full page spreads and printed magazines. Um, and I, again, anecdotally have been like pretty pleasantly surprised, um, at just how many people have told us they've heard about us via a print ad. Um, again, it's really hard to measure the, the ROI there. Um, but I think, you know, if your customer is reading print magazines, which ours certainly is, um, it's just another way of meeting them where they are. How, now, how are you asking your customers where they heard about you? So we, we use um, an app, post-purchase app that you actually had, Matt, on your um, show. Uh, so Inquire is what it's called. Um, and you basically, when people check out, it'll say, how did you hear about us? And you can feed them with a 
bunch of different options. And I've been pleasantly surprised at how many people say print ads. We also put like a QR code in the UTM um, that we're able to track, but not everyone is super sophisticated with the QR codes. So I'm not sure how reliable that is. See, I ask, I ask these questions on this podcast that I already know the answer to and people think it's fake. And it's like, no, it's just like a lot. There's a lot of patterns in all of these successful brands that they have a lot in common. Uh, but they also have a lot that's not in common to be completely frank. There's like no right way to do it. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, there's no playbook. I would say that I feel like when you start a business, like I made the mistake and here's another mistake I made was, you know, calling every single person I knew who was a founder or was a VC and just like asking them, how do I do X, Y, and Z? Um, what do you think about this? Like, what should I do here? And I was like constantly searching for some sort of playbook, um, because it felt like that was the way to do it. Um, and I think the best entrepreneurs learn early on that there is no playbook. Every business is different. You're going to know more about your business than anyone else does. So like very fine to take in inputs from all those different people and, you know, read the articles on what the other companies are doing and talk to other founders. But um, you're going to know what's best um, for your business at the end of the day. So having the ability to sort of filter through that feedback um, is really important. And I think um, when you're a first time founder, it's so easy to like try to follow some path set out by you know someone else. Awesome. That leads itself to kind of another question uh, that I've started to get more in the habit of asking is how as, along this journey, have you guys been partnered up with agencies or consultants or freelancers? You know, there's obviously some things that are outside of the founder's skill set. So how did you guys kind of solve for that? Yeah. Um, so we've certainly had our fair share of um, help along the way. Um, so I mean, for one, our team has grown from two to 40. Um, so we have a lot of people on our team. Um, most of that is within like our fulfillment and customization organization. Um, but outside of our, our own employees, we've certainly worked with agencies, um, freelancers on everything from, you know, paid ads to, you know, copywriters, photographers um, on the creative side. Um, you know, certainly have tried our hand at some marketing consultants. I can't necessarily say that that was ever um, a, a huge uh, value add. Um, I don't know that we had the right partners, but I mean, I think it's you. You have to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, and you know their core competencies are different than yours. Um, so I think that it just depends on you know what the founder's background and skill set is, um, what you choose to outsource and bring in house too. It's like you know what do you want to be your company's sort of bread and butter and what's going to be core to your growth and, and what your differentiation in the market. So for us, something like customization would be that something we've really invested in. Um, and what's something that you don't think you need to be, you know, the best in the world at and you can outsource. Um, that's kind of how we've approached it. Absolutely. Now, is there uh, anything that you guys are looking forward to in the future? Like what's around the corner or, or what, what big projects are you working on that you're allowed to share? Yeah, so we we're constantly working on a product launch calendar. So we have new we we typically do new products every single month. Um, so a lot of fun stuff coming. We launched um kind of our summer kids cover ups yesterday. We have some new piping colors coming this summer. The long awaited bath mats and bath rugs um coming later this summer, which has been a number one customer request from us, um from our customers, excuse me, and just a lot of exciting new product launches. Um, in terms of you know what's next for us, we're we're really looking hard at retail. Been thinking about that, which would be a big um, strategic shift for us, for sure. What about um, marketplaces? Are you guys in any of the marketplaces? Or are you only D2C? We're only D2C. Um, so the thing about marketplaces, I definitely, um, you know, I can see the value add there in terms of just, you know, building brand awareness and reaching new audiences. The thing that makes it very difficult for a company like Weezy to be in the marketplaces is that customization. Um, so the actual customization process you have to go through really needs to be on our website. Um, so that's made it difficult for us to sort of participate in, in the marketplaces without, you know, a heavy investment on the tech side. Um, so for that reason, we've sort of stayed away. But that's not to say it's it won't happen in the future. Awesome. Yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. So uh, for for people that are listening, where do they go if they want to check out the towels, check out the product? Yeah, so our website is wheezytowels.com. Um, our Instagram is at Wheezy Towels. Um, and you can find us there. We're posting all the time. Cool. And is there anything I forgot to ask that you want to share today? I don't think so. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today, Lindsay. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. I can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey with us. We've got a lot to think about and potentially add into our own business. You can find all the links in the show notes. Make sure you head over to honestecommerce.co to check out all of the other amazing content that we have. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review. 
And obviously, if you're thinking about growing your business, check out our agency at electriceye.io. Until next time.